So I was going to today start a huge historical deep dive into the New Testament. You guys might remember I announced that. Um, and I'm really excited for that, except for one fact that since we're not going to be out there, I mean, I'm talking, these are, it's quite the presentation. Um, it's going to be multiple weeks long. So with everything weird today, cause of the leak out in the auditorium and the nursery and all that, I'm like, it's probably not a good day to start that presentation. So if you guys are cool, I'm going to delay that one week. Um, and that'll be next week. Hopefully we'll be rolling just fine. And I already talked to Troyce. I'm going to be using the full presentation setup in the auditorium. So make sure you let everyone know I'll be going through it more lecture style, but the information we're going to be covering in the next few weeks is going to be extremely important. I think for the Christian faith. So I think of all the things that, um, we've covered up to this point, the next few weeks will probably be the most important just because it's going to be defending the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's going to be defending the historicity of the New Testament. How do we know the Gospels are accurate? Things like that. So, um, however, this week, I'm not doing that because, again, it's just different. This week is weird. I already talked to John about it. He thought a review would just probably be best. Um, but um, we already did a review a couple weeks ago before the missions conference. And then I was also in Florida last week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And uh, I got sunburn. I've never been more excited to get a sunburn in my life. So um, so it's been, this is week four, like this is going to be the fourth week since our last class, which is a lot. And we did two weeks of the canon, how we, dis how we know that the Bible is the right and accurate canon. How do we know we have the right books? Um, I had Brian in and I did a, a week before. I talked a lot about um, the New Testament. And so we kind of think we've covered that. What I wanted to do today was do a quick review of the arguments for God's existence, because I think between the arguments for God's existence and then the next few weeks as we cover defending the New Testament and the uh, events of the Gospels that they claim, like the resurrection of Christ, I think between those two things, we're going to have the strongest arguments and apologetic for our evangelism. Does that make sense? Um, so there's, I will quickly review this. Now, some of you guys may not have been here for this. I've mentioned these. There are three main ways of doing apologetics, remember, as far as defending the faith. We have what we call presup, okay? That's short for presuppositional apologetics. I'm just going to call presup. Presuppositional means that when you're arguing and I'm using arguing in the formal way, not actually yelling at each other. Like, as you're having a discussion with somebody, presuppositional apologetics means you're, you would argue from the position that the Bible is true and that God exists. Now, this is very popular in Reformed circles, and it's because a lot of people believe that, well, if God is true, if God is real, I don't need to defend him, I just need to argue like he exists. So in other words, I'm going to argue straight up that this is what the Bible says. So if somebody says something wrong uh, or they believe something wrong, I just quote a verse to them and then just appeal to God. The issue is with that, with presuppositional apologetics, is a lot of people, if you're quoting verses to them, you're trying to just give them general reasons to believe in God, but you're arguing like God exists, you're not really making a case that God does exist. You're just saying that I'm right, you're wrong. Does that make sense? Um, so I will steer this class away from anything presuppositional, okay? Just because I think we should be what we do. Um, I am a man of balance, I like to think. So I would like to do classical to evidential. Now, evidential, I think, um, wow, I can't, there you go. There we go. That's close enough, right? So when we're dealing with apologetics, classical and evidential, so evidential is pretty evident, isn't it? Evidential is you're arguing for evidence. What is the evidence in support of your claim? Um, I'm a big fan of evidential because facts are a lot harder to refute. Um, and it also gives people something more grounded to believe in, right? Uh, I also, I'm a big fan of the classical approach. Usually when I'm preaching or giving a presentation, I'm only given like an hour, I do a classical approach. So rather than walking through people with like, I'm going to walk you guys through 10 evidences of the faith. Well, that could be a lot of information, right? So what I, instead what I'll do is I'll do a classical approach, which is split into two. One is an argument for God. Then the next is an argument for Jesus. 
Okay? So, because you can argue for Jesus, but if you don't have a good reason to believe in God, and that precedes this, you can understand why you normally want to argue for God first and then lean into your Christian faith. There's a reason why in this course, uh, in these classes, I have built it so that way we're first talking about arguments for God's existence first, and now, starting next week, we're segueing into the historical case for the New Testament. Okay? And it's going to be a multi-week course. Um, and I say course, it's just going to be hopefully you're listening and it makes sense to you. So that is what the goal is. That's why I'm just letting you guys know I do not do presuppositional. I think classical is great if you're discussing with somebody uh, over a shorter period of time. Evidential is the best if you have long times with people and you're studied. <laughs> Otherwise, classical, honestly, this works the best usually with normal people. Okay? So, way to be late, guys. Sorry. It's not like it's a chaotic mess out there, right? For real. For real. I had to pick up my stuff. <laughs> is that your excuse choice? Yes, it okay. is. So, with that being said, I am going to just, because next week we're going to get really into the New Testament, I'll be quoting, there will be charts, there will be quotes, there will be the whole nine yards. Um, I just want to do a review, a quick cursory review of the arguments for God's existence, so that way we're doing our classical apologetic properly, okay? So, very simple. First, you guys have heard this one before here. A couple of times now. The Kalam cosmolog cosmological argument, also known as the cause, right? Causation. So what this is, is you're going to be dealing with everything that begins to exist as a cause. The universe, by all evidence, began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause, right? And God is the best explanation for the universe's existence. Now, everything expands, we all see, from a singular point. And that's what we call the Big Bang, right? And that's got like a negative connotation in Christian circles, but that's okay. We just need to understand that that's the singularity, that's the event where the, everything expanded. In fact, the Bible even set, uses the word that God expanded the heavens, okay? So, the first cause is something that's important when we're discussing this. So, um, a great way to, the reason why this is important is because atheists usually posit a few arguments for the universe's existence without God. Because what does the universe consist of? Time, space, and matter, right? And you need all three of them for the universe to exist, right? You can't have time, because if with, you can't have, have no time, because when would you put something? You can't have matter, because what would you put something, right? All these things are necessary. Time, space, and matter. Uh, space would be where you put it. So. When it comes to the calm, we are dealing with time, space, and matter. These all began at once by all evidence pointing. So therefore, anything that causes time, space, and matter must not be time, space, and matter. Right? Must be outside of time, space, and matter. Because something can't cause something within itself. Something outside has to cause it. Right? So that is what we're saying that God is. So God is something outside of time, space, and matter. That was the first cause. This is good because a lot of people are proposing what we call the multi-universe theory. If you've seen a Marvel movie, you'll probably get a good idea of what that is. Um, but the multi-universe theory is just the... Uh, hey, thanks, man. My bad, I took it with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, the right, the right one is working nicely so far. Um, so, because what they're saying is it's a multiple universe theory, so universe is branching out of black holes and whatnot infinitely to create an infinite number of universes. The problem is with that is that there still has to be a beginning universe. So cool, I'll go, okay, great, there could be an infinite amount of universes, but what was the first one that they all split from? What caused it? So again, remember, don't get caught up in all the annoying little details as you're arguing. Grant the things that you can grant, and then just argue your main premise. Okay? Do not get caught up in all the sticks, otherwise you're going to chase rabbit trails and your apologetics are going to fall apart. Because um, you'll be like, All right, why are we arguing over here? Never even thought, wow. <laughs> the other thing is that atheists say that the universe is uh, maybe past infinite. So it means it went on forever in the past. But the problem is with measuring past infinities is, you guys may remember me talking about this before, how did we reach today? If you go... So I, I'm here today, that's how many days? Okay, well, it's an inf infinite. How do we even get to today then? It, it's nonsense, it's right? Yeah. 
It's a different category. Right, it's a different category. A good way, uh, you guys have heard me talk about it, but the hotel of infinitude. So you have a hotel with infinite number of rooms. Each one has somebody in it, right? There's no vacancy in this infinite hotel. And then suddenly somebody walks in and goes, I want a room in the infinite hotel. And the person at the front counter goes, hey, I'm sorry, every room is taken in our infinite hotel. They're like, but I really, really want a room. And then the person goes, okay, we'll just move everyone over one room in our infinite hotel and you can get a room. We'll just move them on to the next room, to the next room forever. Well, in that example. So you're just infinitely moving between rooms. Right. So in that example, the, the hotel is our universe. The rooms are days and the people are events in the days. We, and today would be the person wanting a room. So the person's going in, uh, we're going in with today and our past infinite universe going, we want to insert today into this infinite universe. Where would you even put it? It doesn't make sense. It just keeps going forever. So today is nonsensical. If your brain's having a hard time wrapping around that, that's because it's impossible. It's nonsense. So if you're going, I'm not tracking at all, that's why. <laughs> so the universe can't be past infinite, therefore it must have a cause. Okay. You, you can't add to it, you can't subtract from it. Exactly. So therefore it doesn't exist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you can't multiply, divide, or subtract. So. <laughs> and then we have the argument for design, which is the teleological argument. Teleo meaning design in the Greek. This is very similar to the causation argument. And you guys have all heard the watchmaker argument, right? No. No? Are you serious? No, no, yeah. Oh, okay, I thought you were like, no. I'm like, I feel like every Christian's heard it, but I'll tell it anyway, just in case. If you're like, I've never heard it, and I don't want to be the dumb one in the room, that's cool. I'll explain it. The idea is this. A watch is highly intricate. I'm wearing a skeleton watch, a self-winding. It's very cool to look at, um, especially if you have like a monkey brain like me who just <laughs> likes to drool a lot when you stare at it. This watch is highly designed. You would never look at this watch and go, well, I guess over millions of years after a big bang and after a singularity and then maybe X, Y, Z and that eventually came to form. Holy cow, you have an accidental watch. Yeah, what tree did you get that from? What tree? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the fossil tree. <laughs> <laughs> so you never assume that because there is a design. It's evident that there is a design. So when it comes to you guys right now, you just think of your body, for example. Now, some of us are probably more self-conscious about our bodies than others, but our, we have, our bodies are so intricately designed. Our eyes are so intricately just designed. I mean, you talk, we even have doctors just for eyeballs. Think about that. <laughs> um, we have people who don't even, to this day, we don't even know how the brain fully works. It's such, so our bodies are more complex than our most complicatedly designed rockets and computers. And meanwhile, we want to say that that happened by accident. Well, or if we take Occam's razor, the simplest answer is usually the right solution, just probably a design, if it appears like it has a design, right? Um, when we went over that argument, you guys might remember I talked about um, various principles that keeps our universe intact. And all these principles, if one shifted, we'd all die, such as the amount of hydrogen in, in the air, the, gravitational force of the earth. If that moves just this much, we're dead. Um, if you uh, change the amount of like of oxygen, everything, if you moved it up, everything would combust. If we were a little bit further away from the sun, we'd freeze to death. If we were a little bit closer, we'd burn up. If you guys remember, I went, there's 120 of these principles. I did not go through all of them. I went through five. <laughs> um, but people have likened it. Physicists, astrophysicists have stated that the chances of our planet landing in such a way, it would be like take, taking the entire state of Texas, covering it over two inches of quarters, taking one quarter, painting it red, throwing it in the middle of the state, blindfolding you, and then telling you to pick it up on your first try. That are the, that's the odds of our, of our world being life-sustaining. And now you can believe that's an accident, sure, but just don't tell me I'm the one believing in a fairy tale. Um, for another great example, Dr. William Lane Craig uses this example a lot, and many of you guys know he's very brilliant. Um, don't agree with him on everything, but he's very brilliant. Um, he put it perfectly. If, you, if we were to execute you, 
All right, Troy, so I'll use you because you're right in the front row. If I, we were to execute you, we put you up against the wall. Every single one of us had a fully loaded AR-15 <laughs> and we all shot at you on the count of three and you opened your eyes and around you was a perfect outline of your body, but the entire wall was peppered. Would you think that was an accident? No, you'd be like, either that or you're really bad shots, right? <laughs> All of you have had too much to drink this I morning. Lay off the limo. Of so that's the idea, right? It would be uh, that, and that's what they've likened it unto. Like taking one shot in the middle of the universe and somehow you nailed a bullseye light years away. So teleology, so with the first cause, and teleology, atheists have admitted these two are the strongest cases for a god's existence. Because it's really hard to think of any, any other great explanation, right? So that was, that's when we're dealing with like the universe itself. I mean, we could talk about a lot of other things with how our world functions, the ecosystems within it, the food chain, how it all happens to be so tightly wound. Um, but then we have philosophical. Now, these are, have been philosophical, but remember we talked about, I think in lesson two, the importance of philosophy. Do you guys remember that lesson? Mm -hmm. That philosophy, and I will, I always make a, um, I always make a controversial statement in churches when I discuss this. Jordan's here, my friend, and he would agree Philosophy is usually considered greater than, or at least precedes theology. Philosophy precedes theology. So uh, what I mean by that is your philosophy is always going to come before your thinking of God. So theology is a st study of God. Philosophy is a study of reality and knowledge. Philosophy is always going to come before theology. Now, I know people go, what? But we're Christian. Theology has to come first. Theology is literally a branch of philosophy. For example, when you read your Bible, what do you do? You have a philosophical view that you already have on how to interpret that Bible, and you're applying it on there. For example, if you're a covenant theologian or a dispensational theologian, you're going to have a different philosophical framework at what, how you approach the text, right? So your philosophy usually precedes theology. Also, could we apply a circular idea here that they... Oh, goodness. Like they, they feed each other. Right. Well, so that's why your well, that's why your th philosophy will always feed your theology. Well, my theology influences my philosophy. Philosophy comes first, though. Because, well, for yeah, example, what I'm saying is, well, for example, for example, you believe knowledge can be known, right? You believe truth can be known. Uh -huh. That's a philosophical presupposition okay. you have before you even study theology. That is to believe in something, to think that I could gain information and know truth, is what we call the philosophical study of epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. Yeah, but I, I think to say that theolo sorry, that the Bible only deals with theology would be wrong. That's true. I would agree. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying your philosophy will always feed your theology. For example, Jordan, I love it now that you're here. I can like start bouncing off. He's like crap. For example, we went through laws. Do you guys remember the laws, some of the laws of logic? My favorite one is the law of non contradiction. Right? I can't say something is right while also saying it's wrong. Right? It's a well, contradiction. <laughs> it makes, it's nonsense. However, um, Augustine or Augustine and John Calvin and Arminius, right? Is that what it was? Yes. See, I learned. Um, so Augustine believed that logic did not apply to God. Calvin echoed that and same with Arminius. Now, if you're saying that, that is a philosophical question because you're dealing with, also dealing with laws of logic, another branch of philosophy. Okay. So here's the thing. It's, if God commands you to do something, is it good? Or, right? Is it? If God commands you to do something, is it good? I, this, I'm not, this is not your question. <laughs> yes, it is good. However, depending on your theology, your philosophical presuppositions about God, certain people, um, like our Reformed brothers and sisters, might say, in a sense, that God decreed all things, which is a royal command, and all things happen for good. Therefore, even evil is good. Think about that for a second. 
And now you can see why philosophy matters, because we don't want contradictions in our theology. Don't they right? say that evil can be used for good, not that evil is good? Well, it depends, because if you're saying that, for example, I will use one of the most abhorrent things. Uh, if, they, if God decreed, which is a royal command, let's say something like child rape, we would be like, that is horrific. But we said God decreed it, therefore God makes evil good. He's making evil itself a good thing for his own glory. So they say all things that take place happen for his own glory. So that's a problem because that means God is also glorified by evil. You see, you see the problem there? Am I wrong on that, Jordan? You can expand on that. You're really good at expanding on that. Yeah, so what he's saying is, is correct. That what, the, the way it goes is God wills evil to happen so that he can bring good out of it. And what God wills is good because he's so willed it. Right. Yeah. That, that's, so it's so willing evil for good, good, which is strange. Well, then everything becomes good and everything becomes evil. Right, so it, beca it becomes a big blur. The ends justify the means. Well, see, my philosophy teacher in college said, you know, everything that exists is good in that it exists. Now, I never did believe that. You know, and it's just, good. <laughs> just because it's there, it's good. I know, but come on. But I think his point that good can come out of evil, because yeah. the Lord God can put, uh, you You might have to go through awful things. He doesn't put you through awful things. You might have to go through awful things because there's sin in the world, there's sin in people. It affects us, but out of that, I think that's what he was But it would create good can come because over. Christ can heal, Christ can uh, redeem, Christ can change, Perfect. transform. Right, yeah. so the thing is that we can experience evil, yeah. and God can redeem us out of evil, right? He can rescue you from evil, he can be your comfort during evil, but it's not that God's willing evil for your good. We have to be careful uh, with our language here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, anyway, that's that. that. I went way down, further down the rabbit hole than I wanted to on that. Um, but uh, we do need to get to the problem of evil and suffering. But I feel like that's going to have to be a multi-week course. Um, all right. Now, the other argument uh, for God's existence. One is also, uh, you already have heard me do this one many times, mainly because it's my favorite one to watch people chase their tails on. Um, the moral argument. Uh, this is really great nowadays because uh, we are in the time of social justice, right? And racism is bad. You know, think about the poor and the lowly and this entire justice, right? That's what everyone's obsessed with. Mm -hmm. Cool. How do you know what's right and wrong? It's a good question, right? Because we've already dealt with this. You guys have seen my little two-story chart plenty of times. But we are doing supernatural... Actually, no, that's not a good, that's not a good description. Erase that. Metaphysical. Let's do that. An even longer word? <laughs> it's more accurate. Metaphysical versus physical. All that exists is the physical universe, meaning material. Here, what we have on Earth. If all that exists is that, remember... You do not have access to things that are non-physical. For example, justice. Justice is not material, right? I can't pick up justice in my hand. I can't throw justice at your face um, as much as I might want to, right? So you can't. It's non-physical. So that means we have to say, if you're an atheist, that means that all you have, it, you have is the physical world, which means you have to start explaining these things physically. Oh, uh, these are just things that we evolved and developed over time in our civilizations for coexistence. Cool, that's fine and all, but then you can't get mad at, say, the Middle Eastern world when they throw homosexuals off rooftops. Because that's just their culture and their society and how they've learned to function. You see, then it becomes what we call subjective. Because there's a big difference between objective versus, oops, see now I'm, I'm mixing into, I'm just gonna put subjective, okay? I'm a lefty and on a whiteboard that's super difficult. I would like you to do that. Um, hover and scribble. Uh, so objective versus subjective, that is a S-U-B and a J, I promise, okay? So objective means true for everyone, subjective means different for everyone, okay? If we say something is right or wrong, for example, is it always wrong to be a mass shooter? 
Let's all agree, okay. Yeah. Otherwise, somebody, Dwayne called, called the FBI. Um, so, yes, we would go, yeah, that is definitely wrong. No matter what, it is always wrong, true for everybody. If it's true for everybody, we are making an objective statement. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're saying something's true for everybody, we and a law, if there's a law, a moral law, there must be a moral law yeah. giver. Mm -hmm. This was C.S. Lewis's main argument, right? It's actually, I think, the argument that really brought him to, to faith, if, I, if memory serves. Am I right, Jordan? Okay. Sorry, he's an encyclopedia on a lot, on a lot of these knowledge, so I'll just make sure I bounce off of him. So, when it comes to morality, then, morality must come from somewhere. If there's no God, all morality is subjective. Right? Because if you, well, you just got to do what's right for you. Well, what if what's right for me is to shoot up my school? Because I feel like they mistreated me. What if I feel like that girl whom I've obsessed over for many years, she never gave me the love that I want, desired, so what if I just take her by force? Uh, in my devotions, actually, the other day, I ran through Genesis, and I just got through that part with, um, with uh, Dina Leah's daughter, where um, Hesha, uh, Hashem raped her, and then went to Jacob going, hey, can I marry him? And then they're like, yeah, circumcise all your guys, and we're going to come kill you. Um, okay? Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> My white people <laughs> chuckle at that. <laughs> so, um, so objective moral standards have to come from somewhere. Therefore, and God's the only way we can have objective moral standards. We can't say it's society because societies are all different. We can't say it's personal because everyone's different. We can't say it, de it, it depends on your class because classes are different. There's no way to measure morality consistently without God. And it also happens that people, no matter where they're at in the world, usually agree on some of the most horrific things. Oddly enough, it's almost like there's a book that said that the law is written on our hearts, but that's yeah. not my business. Um, anyway, so the moral law. Then there's the, law, the argument from, for meaning, which is very similar. How many of you guys have always heard the joke, why are we even here? What is the meaning of life? Right? <laughs> So, <laughs> what is the meaning of life, guys? Well, if there's no God, spoiler alert, there isn't a meaning to life. Mm -hmm. You are cells that just happen to become self-aware, and you will live, and you will die, and that is it. It's kind of depressing. One might say nihilistic. Um, in fact, I theorize the more we've removed God from schools and from our culture, there's a reason why we see depression and anxiety and hopelessness go up, and same with suicide. And it's because we're telling people you're a space accident, nobody cares about you, you're uh, really, ultimately, meaningless. Okay. Isn't that comforting? <laughs> so if we're saying that you have no meaning, then you wonder why I'm like, well, then I just want to die, because life is a lot of suffering. That's right? How many of you have suffered in life? <laughs> yeah. Do you want that suffering to be meaningless? <laughs> no. That's horrible. So therefore, we have to have a, a meaning, and is meaning subjective, or is it objective? Well, it's funny, because you'll find people who try to find their subjective meaning, and they'll pursue money, fame, and wealth, and yet you'll meet a lot of these people who that's all they pursued, and are they happy people when they've reached their goal? No. I mean, you ever read, look at celebrities' lives and think that's, they're happy after their sixth divorce? Mm -hmm. No. They're usually miserable. It's always drama, right? You always go by Time Magazine. There's always some drama going on in Hollywood. And you're like, yeah, you can keep your mansion, buddy. I like my life in peace, mm -hmm. right? Because whenever you try to just pursue your own desires, it just run, it runs up being nothing. But if we say people are valuable, there's an objective meaning, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. For example, if there is no meaning, then they're actually, what's, why would it be wrong for me to shoot Troyce right now? Sorry, buddy. I'm just picking on you today. Who would it be? You're just like, oh, well, that's unfortunate for him, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't really matter, right, in the grand scheme of things. However, as Christians, if, you're, if you believe that you have meaning, that life has meaning, that life is valuable, therefore, God must exist. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then, of course, there's also what we call the thinking argument. Um, this one's a fun one, thinking. How many of you guys like to think? Uh, oh, how many of you guys like to just put your brain in front of a TV and just let it melt out your ears. <laughs> so the thinking argument. This is pretty simple. Atheists, by and large, Matt Delonte, Dr. Sam Harris, I could go on. 
all are what we call physical determinists. In other words, they do not believe you actually have any ability for what we would call free will. You, don't, you can't really think because you are just nature versus nurture and whatever nature gave you, right? You're whatever you're born with. So therefore you can't really think because something else caused you. Something caused you, something wired you, and now you are what you are. So your brain just works the way it was pre-wired to work. So you can't even trust your thoughts because your thoughts were already pre-programmed because you are just biology. Yeah, that's another depressing thought, isn't it? You're like, well, now I don't want to live anymore. Um, think about that though. But how many of you guys know you can know information? I do know that. I can think for myself. I can change my behavior. Um, to quote Jordan, I can choose between better or worse response, right? So if that's the case, I can't think, I have, a fr I have a free mind. Now, granted, am I limited to some degree? Yes, of course, I'm not a genius. I don't have an IQ of 400, okay? <laughs> I am going to be limited, of course, but I can, right? I have a capability, there's something there. I can learn behavior. My daughter's learning behavior every single day, right? Um, and she copies us, it's actually really funny because she's uncoordinated as heck. So a lot of people, I'll like do something with my hand and she's like, I'm like, good job, honey. Very good. Um, so the um, thinking argument is, a, is just that. It's whether or not you have an ability to even think, behave, or choose, or anything like that. Are you pre-wired? And what's funny is I've actually seen <laughs> um, my, my, the president of my seminary, Dr. Braxton Hunter, argued atheist Matt Dillahunty, and he used what he called the free will defense because he didn't believe, uh, Matt Dillahunty didn't believe in free will. And it's actually really funny to see him arguing on there. And he's like, so you're telling me I don't have the, I didn't choose to do that. He's like, well, I just don't know that. He's like, so you don't know I choose to do that. It's like, I just, well, I will we'll never know. And he's like, but I'm choosing to do that. <laughs> this is really funny to watch that interaction because Matt Dillon, he's like, I hosted the Atheist Experience TV show for X amount of years. I was like, yeah, but did I choose? Anyway, debunked by a snap of the finger. Michael um, Fraser strikes again. Yeah. But then also he pointed out as well to even engage in debate then defeats your premises, your yeah. premise. Because you're debating, which means that you are appealing for me to change my mind. Yeah. So therefore... If you're like, well, think about it. Well, in, in your premise, I can't. Mm -hmm. I am whatever I'm pre-programmed to be. So anyway, fun, fun argument there. Like I said, this is a quick review. I don't have time to give the full lectures as I've done in the past, but I'm giving you guys the cursory overview. Uh, then finally, what was my last one? I have to, give me a minute. Give me a minute. And moral, meaning, thinking. Uh, oh, um, identity. I think I don't need to write that one. Identity. Who am I? That's a big question. Well, if, if you believe in God, then you know your creation of God. Therefore, you are one of his children made in his image. If not, again, your biological accident. And then finally, one of the things that Christianity offers that others don't, which is simply a destiny, if we can use that term. Um, I know these, this can be a loaded term, but I'm just going to use it for now. Which is ultimately that there, if you believe that there is a morality, there is a meaning, I can think, and I have an identity. Because if there, these don't exist, for example, if morality or meaning don't exist, Adolf Hitler was no better than Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, again, they were whatever they were pre-programmed to be, doing whatever they thought was right in their own personal views. It doesn't matter anyway in the long scheme of things. However, then also, I should say, we should also say that Adolf Hitler doesn't receive any punishment ever for his crimes. Another, and Mother Teresa is never rewarded. Um, however, if you believe in God, you know there's an ultimate judge. You know that Adolf Hitler and anyone who's evil who gets away with it ultimately won't. And that still, those who are good and moral and virtuous in this life will get proper reward. Okay? I know I'm arguing now from a Christian perspective. But I went from argument for God to like, I'm just going to bump shift over here. But that's the point. That is why, so these are some of the more powerful arguments I use on a regular when I have conversations and they have been successful. Now the next thing, what we're going to be covering for the next weeks, is going to be the historical case for the New Testament. Because Christianity, let's just be honest guys, we can argue for God all day, but this just gets you to theism. This gets you, I believe in God. Yeah. But what God? Yep. 
So what? Can, can I ask you? Yeah. I just throw out a couple of objections. Oh, say, here we go. Right. So, like from the moral argument. Mm -hmm. So if I say objective moral truth is true for you, but it isn't true for me, then I, <laughs> so, you, so then how I, do you it, respond to that? Because objective that truth is, is true uh, for me, but not for you. It's true for you, but it isn't true for me. Okay, so at that point, then, we are still arguing subjectively, because it's it might be objective true for you, but now you're still arguing for subjectivism, correct? You're saying it's true for well, you, you that, and I, that's, true for you, true for me, it's a right. I mean, different it's true truth. true for you, but it isn't true for me. Cool, so can I steal your phone? You've got your truth, I've got my truth. Cool, so can I steal your phone? Um, you can try. Is it wrong for me to steal your phone? Mm -hmm. um, Some cultures. In my subjective truth, yes. Okay, so now when it comes to something like stealing your phone, why is it in your subjective truth yes, if my subjective truth is no? Um, in my objective truth, as you just told just me, I can take whatever I want. Because I just know that it is. Because you just know that it is. Mm -hmm. So... I don't need a God to tell me what is right or wrong. I, I know. You, you, just, you just know what is right or wrong. Yeah. So Adolf Hitler said the same thing. That he knew what was right and what was wrong. Is he wrong? Well, I know that that's wrong. So you know, so you get to dictate what's right and wrong for everybody else. Well, I mean, it was true for him, but it's not true for me. So now we're back into subjectivism. So now you can't really say he's wrong. In your view, he might be wrong, but in his view, he's right. So in that right. world, it's nobody's right or wrong. I, I just know that he's wrong. So you have a philosophical price tag you have to own no matter what. So if you're saying that it's true for you, great, and it's true for him, great, well, everyone's true. The philosophical price tag is true for you, but it isn't true for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, now we're just in a, so, and that's usually where, if they want to get really pedantic, that's where they get. And that is funny. Like I said, you'll see them chase their tails on it. So you put, but that's, now you just made, so then I'll just be like, so, then that's usually when I bring up something abhorrent. Like, so do you, so the child rapist, should he go to prison? Well, yeah, I, I know that that's wrong. How can you say it's wrong? You said it, you said it, yeah, but you said it's true for you, <laughs> but it's also true for him. So why would he punish him for doing what he thought was subjectively right? Um, just, that's the way it is. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that, that is literally where you'll get, so you'll, okay, so, Jordan, by the way, you're really good at being the atheist in this, in this experience. <laughs> But can you guys already see where that contradiction is lying, where it's like, oh, but, okay, but it's true for, and then, because it, it, it's really great, but once you bring up something actually really abhorrent, then it turns into, well, yeah, we, so yeah. should, now in that situation, should we punish him? Should we punish? No. We shouldn't punish the rapist. No, because the universe determined that he would do that. So in that, in such a world, would you be able to live in such a world? So if I believe in, some, in that, I could shoot you right now and just take your phone. I do live in that determined that he would do that and that we would put him in jail. So that's why he's there. It's not that it's right or wrong or subjective or, you know, objective. It's just, that's the way it is. So it's just, it's just, wait. If we all share the same subjective truth, does it then become, a, it become an objective truth? <laughs> or, or get, well, I was going to say something like that because if we say everything's objective, that is an objective statement. Well, so that's why in this right. case, so the, the difference is between me and you, atheist Jordan, is I have a measuring stick. I can say this is right. No matter what, we should jail the guy, not because he was pre-programmed, but because he made a, cho a moral choice. And I have a measuring stick to say this is objectively wrong and we should jail him and punish him for it. In your worldview, it doesn't really matter. So in a sense, it, the children starving in Africa, all these evil problems, aren't really evil to begin with, so you're arguing for kind of nonsense at that point because no society or group of people would ever be able to function in such a way. We'd all just die, burn, and be killed in chaos and anarchy. Interesting. <laughs> that's fun. I, I, but yeah, that's usually, sometimes, usually when I'm actually having a normal conversation, so Jordan wanted to be like, I want to be disagreeable. <laughs> Jordan is, uh, when we're talking about agreeable and disagreeable people, he's 120% on the disagreeable. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is like, absolutely no. That's and that when I remember when I said this is the one that I love to watch people chase their tail on. That he was doing it perfectly, where it's like everyone's laughing and they're like, "Wait, what?" There was an apologist. I'll leave you guys with this because um, there's an apologist that he was talking about how truth is objective. Truth is true for everybody, and he's talking about like the nature of what is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, a student at the university stood up. And started objecting 
No, nothing is true. Nothing is true. Nothing is important. It's meaningless. And just get, starts yelling at the apologist. The apologist kept, keeps going, you can't possibly mean that. Yeah, it's meaningless. There is no truth. And he's like, you can't possibly mean that. No, it's meaningless. There's no point in any of it. Is what you're saying true right now? And it's like, uh. <laughs> well, it's all meaningless. Is what you're saying have meaning? And then he's like, ah. <laughs> he's like, thank you for making my point. And that, and it kind of, that's what we call the roadrunner tactic, by the way, is just, <laughs> is just pick up a mirror and show it to them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's usually why I was trying to lead him into that. He was being smart. I was trying to lead him into like, this child great boy is wrong. Then it's like, he would most of the time be like, yes. And then I'm like, Mirror. So that's a, you just made an objective statement while arguing for subjective statements. Yeah. He was being smart, though. He was like, subjectively, it's true for me. And I'm like, ah, slippery one, this guy. Um, so, point, you know that argument. I don't like it. Um, but the point is, is that that's why usually if you use like a cause or a moral and then a case for the resurrection or the New Testament, you have a way stronger case because it's a building block, mm -hmm. right? So... I encourage you to get as many people at the church as possible as you can to start coming in the next few weeks because I put a lot together on it. Um, lesson one is 62 slides, so it'll probably take us two weeks to get through it. Just throwing that out there. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about next week, just so you guys know, a little teaser, is going to be do we actually have eyewitness testimony of the New Testament? Okay, so that's going to be the question. Do you have an answer. outline on the website or anything? Do you have an outline that's published? So, like, if we say to my, if I say to my grandson, this is what we're going to study in the next few weeks, is there an outline somewhere? Else? I do not have it because I have it all on slides. Oh, okay. It would be really, yeah, it might be complicated. But I do always record these and we post them on the website. Yeah. Thank you, Vicki, wherever she's at. She, I think, will walk up. Okay. She's Bob's here, here though. <laughs> she posts them on the website, so afterwards you can always do that as well. Getting to come. Hey, look what we're going to study today. So yeah, that, oh, so it'll be eyewitness testimony. Yeah, I mean, I know where I'm going. Eyewitness testimony, do we have early testimony, like close to the actual event of Jesus? And then I'm gonna give the top reasons we know, then I'm gonna give a case for the resurrection. All from just historical facts.